Tamori is one of the few comedians who made it big without any training in comedy. Considered one of the big three legendary comedians and king of daytime talk, he's one of the most recognizable people in Japanese entertainment. Let's take a look at his early life. Tamori was born in Fukuoka near the end of World War II. His grandfather and father had worked for the South Manchuria Railway Company. Upon returning to Japan, his father worked for a steamship company. But like the majority of the people in post war Japan, it was tough times. Tamori describes himself as a very mature child. On his first day of preschool, he observed kids singing, playing, and dancing, and said to his parents, I can't do that, and I refuse to go. And up until elementary school, Tamori spent most of his time people watching from atop a hill. He also spent a lot of time at the harbor watching ships. His elementary school life was pretty normal up until the third grade. When, on one day, while walking home from school, a loose wire from a power pole hit him in his right eye. A freak accident which caused Tamori to be hospitalized for two months. As a result, he lost all his vision in his right eye, and he began to wear an eye patch or dark glasses to conceal it. He could have lost his life that day, and he decided to live a more active life. He started doing martial arts and writing. He also joined a church, not because of some spiritual awakening, but because he thought the priest was really interesting. In junior high school, he got interested in sports and started playing the trumpet in the school's brass band. In high school, he joined the amateur radio club. His dream at the time was to pursue his love of ships and radio and become a maritime radio operator. He had hoped to study radio communications in university, but lacked the science grades to get into a university that offered that as a major. He took a year off and decided to focus on improving his strengths and humanities. During this time, he listened to tons of foreign radio. He wasn't actually learning the language, but enjoyed being able to pretend to speak many languages. He was accepted into Waseda the next year. He joined the modern jazz club, but found they played at a much higher level, and he was made the manager. It was in this club where he gained the nickname Tamori. After his second year of university, his friends had planned a trip, and Tamori used his tuition money to pay for it. Unable to pay for his third year, he was promptly expelled. He went back to Fukuoka and got a job at an insurance company. And worked there for three years. During that time, he also got married. And over the next several years, he worked a few different jobs. One night in the early 70s, after drinking with his old bandmates, just before going home, he stumbled upon several jazz greats having a party and joking around. Tamori and one of his friends jumped in and acted like they were part of the party. After some time, people began to notice them, and when questioned, They pretended to speak several different languages, which the jazz artist thought was hilarious. This guy in particular liked Tamori's antics so much he wanted to know more about him. He started asking around Hakata for Morita and heard of an eccentric cafe manager, the kind of manager who would put a sausage in your drink if you didn't order it properly. Yamashita found Tamori's cafe, and whenever he was in Kyushu, he'd go there. The cafe caught the attention of many jazz enthusiasts thanks to Yamashita, and he had been telling other famous people in Tokyo about the legendary man of Kyushu. He had talked him up so much that they demanded they bring Tamori to Tokyo. And in June of 1975, he did. Tamori performed a one man show and took requests, which left everyone rolling with laughter. He was asked to perform regularly. He agreed to do it for one month only. And for a while, he lived this kind of double life going between Fukuoka and Tokyo. Word of his performances soon reached gag manga pioneer Akatsuka Fujio. 
and he thought Tamari's gags were something special. He got him an opportunity to appear on his variety TV special in August. In fact, he thought he was so funny he didn't want him to go back to Fukuoka. He offered him free use of his four room condominium, Mercedes, and 300,000 yen to extend his stay and perform more jokes until the recording. Tamori's TV debut turned many heads, the most famous of them, Kuro Yanagi Tetsuko. She wanted to know more about him and invited him on her show. Tamori had made quite the circle of friends, and offers were pouring in. After getting some advice, he decided to sign with this talent agency. He also added these four stipulations to his contract. He officially entered showbiz in 1975 at the age of 30. His first regular gig was actually on the Japanese dub of Monty Python's Flying Circus. The Japanese version of the show included their own original sketches, and Tamori's shined brightly. I'd also like to say that Tamori's comedy really meshed well here. At first glance, one may think he's just making fun of other cultures, but I feel it's more of a satire of how his culture viewed foreign culture, which I feel is a shared theme in Monty Python. His somewhat bizarre comedy and radio personality built him a cult following, and he went on to host some of the biggest shows in Japanese entertainment. Anyway, one thing I find amazing about his story is how his misfortunes actually led him to greatness. He hadn't actually dreamed of becoming a comedian, but was more than ready when the opportunity presented itself. And his consistency to provide great hosting every day on live TV for 22 years has touched the lives of millions of people. And that's remarkable. Other info. Tamori is the oldest of the big three, but has a shorter career than many big comedians. And in their younger years, there was some confusion about the seniority system. Speaking of seniority, Tamori angered Masaaki Sakai for not removing his sunglasses in 1975. The two have resolved their differences since then. Tamori is almost never seen without his trademark sunglasses but there is one drama where he appeared in regular glasses. 